light within my heart, light within my thoughts, light within my words. May one and all and everything, blessed and loved, ever be. Welcome. It's a special momentous occasion today. Um, this recording is now the 200th episode, or episode number 200, of uh, Sister Who Presents, the uh, unconventional talk show, I guess you could call it, uh, dealing with issues of life and spirituality, featuring uh, myself as Sister Who, or the complete name is actually Sister Who Does She Think She Is, or Who Does She Think She Is, or however you wish to uh, emphasize it, I suppose. Um, Sister Who Presents first was first cable cast, uh, the first episode ever, in November of 1992. And so that's how long I've been on public access television, uh, encouraging this sort of discussion uh, and encouraging people to think about things and to become more aware of their own lives, to become more aware of their own sense of who. Who am I and what does that have to do with how I present myself to the world? And how does that change throughout my life? Certainly growing up, I had no idea that I would ever become Sister Who. There was no precedent for this work that I knew of. And yet, when circumstances came together, I guess Sister Who was more intuitively created than cognitively created. It wasn't that I planned what Sister Who would be, as that I began piecing together different ideas, things I'd heard people say. Uh, I looked at photographs of some of my past Halloween costumes and recognized a piece here and a piece there. And somehow it all wove together. And then over the first two or three years of being Sister Who uh, continued to evolve that much more. The, the facial makeup evolved for probably the first three years. The costume, I think, evolved for the first six years. And things are pretty much stabilized at that point. Certainly they could change again if there was ever a reason, but um, in the, let's see, 17 years uh, since the makeup uh, stopped at its present configuration, and the uh, 13 years since the uh, costume stopped at its present configuration, there hasn't been any further need. Uh, but who knows, at some point in the future there might be. I don't know if I will always be Sister Who, but I guess growing up in a Roman Catholic church, there was always a sense that nuns were nuns and priests were priests. And and somehow, when I only on one or two occasions heard of, uh, when I asked about Sister So-and-so and was told that, well, she's no longer a nun. And I said, I don't understand. What do you mean she's no longer a nun? It doesn't make any sense. Um, I never considered the uh, possibility of being able to uh, become a nun or stop being a nun. I thought it was who they were. Uh, apparently their life journeys took uh, different turns than was anticipated at the time I knew them. Um, I only heard that about one or two nuns, but, but through all of that, uh, growing up in the Catholic Church, I always wondered, I don't know if I wondered consciously so much, but it was my understanding I guess would be a better way to put it. What makes a nun a nun is a dedication to spiritual service because my mother was a woman, my sister was a woman, but a nun was a nun, and a nun wasn't a woman. And my father was a man, and my brother was a man, but a priest wasn't a man, a priest was a priest. What, you know, and there were there was Sister Janet Mead on the radio uh, with her recording of the Lord's Prayer. There were nuns who went to uh, El Salvador and pissed off the government and got themselves killed. Um, there were nuns who worked in the hospital, nuns who worked in the school. And in my understanding, they were all nuns. They just somehow had different jobs to do. Uh, you know, and then of course there was the nuns in Sound of Music, uh, the movie Sound of Music, the representing the nuns in uh, cloisters and convents who spent their time, uh, spent their days dedicated to prayer, and 
so the activities of nuns were diverse, but what they all had in common was this really, really strong dedication to spiritual service. And it was not, they were very strong women and not to be lightly uh, opposed or uh, argued with, but at the same time, I didn't think of them as women and what made them what they were was their dedication. And yet there was, it was a dedication to service not a dedication to governing or controlling as much as to service. They, in, in my Catholic school, they were basically there to educate these kids and, you know, uh, the other students and I. And even if you didn't want to learn, they were going to make you learn. And you were going to be nurtured and you were going to be developed and you were not going to get through their classroom without becoming a better person. It simply wasn't going to happen. Um, such was their dedication. It wasn't controlling in the sense that we'll be uh, Albert Einstein. You will be uh, a medical professional, you know, whatever. It was, you will be the best you can be, and I'm here to push you toward it. Um, and if anyone's picking on you, uh, they will have me to answer to, and they don't want to do that. And having been in that situation once or twice where I was, there was one occasion where I was being picked on very bad by bullies, and um, dear sister, uh, what's her name, heard about it, and um, none of those boys ever raised their voice to me again uh, after sister heard about it. Um, it just never, ever happened again. And uh, but the the unfortunate thing was that it had to get to. A level where she would notice what was happening because uh, she didn't realize what was going on when we were out in the playground and she was busy preparing the next lesson and so forth. But, um, and so people have occasionally asked me why I became Sister Who rather than Brother Who. And I said, well, the, the ministries of priests and nuns, of, of brothers and nuns, are completely different. And the work that I do as Sister Who, striving to nurture others' personal and spiritual growth, is really the ministry of a nun. And my dedication to service is exactly that. And if I have to walk into a dangerous situation in order to do the right thing in standing up for someone, uh, in order to uh, assist the poor or uh, defend those who cannot defend themselves or whatever, I know I wouldn't hesitate to do it. And there, there have been some situations, uh, not a lot of opportunities, but there have been a few opportunities for me to take that kind of stand. Um, and I've done my best to serve those moments as well as I could, but but thus far anyway, have not had the opportunity to work within a school as formally as they did, where I actually have a room full of students with whom to develop um, those sorts of pedagogical relationships, where I'm seeking to bring out the best in them. Um, there was one sister, for example, who noticed uh, early on, when I was in fourth grade already, uh, that I had uh, remarkable ability with writing, in creative writing specifically. And so she managed to contact a professional poet whose work had been published and arranged for him to come in for a day to teach her fifth grade class about writing and about poetry. And I was in the fourth grade and I was the only student pulled out of the fourth grade class for that day so that I could come in and hear all the presentations and work with this professional poet because she saw a gift in me that at that point no one else had seen. And um, I, it, it, was, it was incredible uh, to have that kind of nurturing attention. And, and yet at the same time, she was dedicated to me becoming all I could be and I didn't know what I could be. And so, in a sense, she saw me better than I saw myself at that point, or at least some aspects of me, and was willing to support that and was not willing to allow me to ignore it, uh, but put me in a position where I had to find out, I had to develop myself. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I feel a lot more resonance with the work that the nuns did from, from what I saw, the, the good examples that were set for me in Catholic school. 
and I have nothing but respect for them, which is why I will not intentionally ever do anything sacrilegious or satirical in relation to the office of a nun. Um, all that being said, uh, here I am in my unconventional attire, um, but every detail of the costume and makeup has some sort of symbolism behind it. And so uh, it's, it's very much a, a celebration of symbolism and metaphor. It's as if uh, you get a look at my soul, uh, as if it's me turned inside out, and all these uh, spiritual interior aspects of me are made visible by the symbols that are now on the outside. If I changed it and put all these symbols back on the inside, where they would be hidden, you might not be able to tell me from anyone else on the block uh, or anyone else in the crowd. Um, but you actually know more about me if you understand the language of the symbols by seeing what I look like now than you would know about me by seeing me when I'm not in ritual garb and, and makeup. In any case, Sister, who does she think she is? Um, that in itself was a, a gift from... Uh, my spiritual godmother, Sister X, who was a Cree Indian, a uh, professional photographer, and an openly gay man in San Francisco, uh, also a member of a group called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, which the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence um, are, in my understanding, primarily political activists. They would have been like the nuns who went to El Salvador and uh, marched on behalf of the poor and pissed off the government and told the politicians what you're doing is wrong. That's the kind of sisters that the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence are. The problem for them, I suppose, if you consider it a problem, is that their primary argument is with the Vatican and the Pope. Uh, in that, uh, in perhaps argumentative or confrontative ways, they've been calling the Roman Catholic Church to reform for a, a good 30 years now. And I don't know that the methods they're using are going to be very persuasive with the Vatican, but that's their work. My calling, uh, I found, was more in a spiritual and educational direction. And uh, they didn't necessarily respond to that well because they believe in being political activists. And so they complained that I wasn't radical enough because I was being spiritual and educational. I wasn't being political. And I kind of shrugged and said, well, we all have our callings. I'll work in the school, you work uh, in the, on the front with liberation theology, um, or, or your version of liberation theology. And, um, and so it's been, we don't have a lot of communication anymore, but, but my spiritual godmother, uh, the one who gave me my name in fact, uh, Sister X, uh, was a Cree Indian who was taught by Sister Xavier, I believe he said, on the reservation. Um, and. Um, so it was kind of in honor of Sister Xavier that he became Sister X. And then as he was listening to my story of growing up in a small town and knowing I was different from the time I was four, but not knowing what gay was, uh, so that the first 20 years of my life was one big identity crisis. And in response to that, he said, well, considering that your life to this point has been one big identity crisis, you should be Sister Who does she think she is? And as soon as I heard it, it was like a flash of recognition. And I just thought, that's it. That is absolutely it. And then I thought, but I don't know what it means. <laughs> and so I had to begin to develop as Sister Who to see what, so what does Sister Who do? And what ultimately became clear is that it's about helping other people grow in their sense of knowing who and what they are and who and what they are in relationship to others around them, and in relationship to the divine. In any case, I promised a number of friends that I would include the various symbolisms within the show, and uh, the time is, is fast speeding by, and so um, I thought maybe I would start with my shoes, but I think maybe I'll switch that around and start with the face instead after all, because um, there's so many different symbolisms. The last time I did this, it took like half an hour to go through them all, but. I'll see how many I can fit into the show for the sake of everyone who's been watching for a long time, perhaps, and has always wondered. Um, when I started, the, the first primary elephant, el elephant, element, <laughs> um, I'm not good at dealing with elephants in the living room. I usually talk about them. 
instead of avoiding them. So that's part of Sister Who's demeanor also, is whatever it is, it should be brought out for discussion. And if you disagree, you're welcome to come on the show and discuss the other side and from your perspective. Uh, but I offer a perspective and hope that it helps uh, to inspire people to think about it, uh, whatever the subject is, in depth. The first element was the Purple Cross, which uh, is a cross, but it's more than a cross. Uh, it may tie, in to some degree, to the Christianity of my upbringing, though now I've, I've since been exposed to a wide range of religions, and I think of myself as an eclectic mystic. Some The mystics being people who were more fascinated with the essence of God than the form, and consequently more fascinated by profound questions than dogmatic answers, so that most of the mystics I read about really don't get into arguing theology that much, because they're more concerned about the questions than they are the answers. And, and yet with all of that, they have this intense day-to-day, moment-to-moment even, relationship with God. Uh, you know, to me, God is the embodiment of love, uh, of greatest love and highest wisdom, and uh, a person, a consciousness that transcends all our definitions of maleness and femaleness and personhood. What a human being can understand as being a person doesn't begin to encompass all that that which is truly God, in my opinion, encompasses. So I started with the cross, but then I tipped it uh, so that one eye is framed in purple and one eye is framed in white. Because very often what we're looking at, um, there, first of all, there's more than one way of looking at things. And what we see often has more to do with what surrounds us than what surrounds what we're looking at. That we look out at the world from within cultural and linguistic perspectives, and we may emulate our, our culture, or we may act as a rebel to it and act in total contrast to it. We may grow up in an environment and become just like our parents, or we may be completely opposite from our parents because we believe everything they did was wrong. And there's all kinds of degrees in between. Anything's possible that way. But either way, there is still something about our context, our environment, the language and the, the place we, in which we grow up, even the economic level. You know, I grew up in a family that was lower middle class. We were just rich enough that we didn't qualify for any financial assistance of any sort, but we were too poor to afford anything um, in a working class town. And, um, and yet with all of that, uh, there was this uh, absence, I guess, of, of prejudice or racism because during the summers we would have uh, kids from Milwaukee come out and stay with us. And so I got to know half a dozen different black kids that way. When I was in college, I had a roommate from mainland China. To me, they were just people. At, when I was seven, I saw on television the animated show Horton Hears a Who, and they dance off into the sunset at the end singing for a person is a person after all. And that's pretty much what I've stayed with all my life. A person is a person is a person is a person. The rest is just description. And uh, I've done my best to treat everyone the same, and I, I think I've mostly succeeded. But um, in any case, uh, being in the working class town, there was no privilege to speak of. We had to work for everything and do without anything we couldn't afford, which was a lot of things. But back to the costume, uh, because time is, is fleeing by here quickly. Um, Purple, to me, purple has a lot of different symbolisms associated with it. But for me especially, it's the balance point between masculine and feminine. Uh, the red and the blue, or the pink and the blue. Um, and when you get to that balance point, uh, the masculine is that which directs and orders and organizes and acts. And the feminine is that which listens and nurtures and questions and receives. And in every person, it's important to have both and to use them and integrate them as wisely as possible. And it doesn't really correspond to gender. There are uh, heterosexual men who have enormous amounts of feminine energy. They're very receptive and nurturing and compassionate and gentle. And there are uh, heterosexual and, and lesbian women who, uh, either way, who have 
uh, enormous amounts of masculine energy. They organize, they direct, they build, they construct, they order, they demand, they require all the masculine stuff. They're warriors. And uh, nurturers and warriors, perhaps, is another way. But they don't exactly correspond to genders or orientations. Not all gay men are... Not all gay men know how to sew drapes, and not all lesbians know how to fix trucks. Um, it, everybody's an individual, and we come from all sorts of different combinations. Um, the other thing about the purple that uh, I, I think has really remained a common thread in Sister Who's work is that it we live at this intersection between our horizontal and our vertical relationships. That there is a sense of ancestry, a sense of groundedness, a sense of what is beneath us, and there is a sense of a divine above us, something that is greater than us, something that leaves us in awe. And if you've never experienced a sense of awe, I would have to question whether you've ever experienced God. And there are so many different ways you can experience awe, and in those moments, you might want to keep your eyes and ears open for some whisper of divine presence that somehow that which is truly God is manifesting to you gently and quietly within that moment. Even when the Old Testament even within the Old Testament of the Bible, God manifests as everything from a burning bush to a cloud to a whisper in the wind to Balaam's donkey, uh, the hand that parted the Red Sea, so many different forms according to so many different opportunities and contexts and environments. Who am I to argue with God that God must reveal God's self in this way to everyone because I said so? Right. God will do what God wants to do, and God will reveal God's self in whatever way God wants to. I am here to do my best to serve the wisdom and love of God, and to serve it within myself, and to serve it within others. And I'm not interested in arguing about dogmatic answers. I think if you can bring the essence of who we are and the essence of God together, God will teach you whatever you need to know. But you have to be listening, and you have to believe that there is something beyond yourself, something transcendent, that can also be within you, even at the same time as it is around you and outside of you. Uh, for humans, the idea of being both within and around is a paradox. I think from God's perspective, there, God understands how it's possible. You know, in the same way that if... You know, for some people to say that water is not always wet is a ridiculous statement uh, until they are give, given a piece of ice. Um, you know, here's water, and lo and behold, it's dry uh, as long as it stays frozen. Uh, as soon as it begins to melt, of course, it gets wet again. But there are ways that paradoxes can be true if we know the dynamics and the context within which that paradox would be resolved. Back to the makeup. Um, three tiers, one for all the evils done to children, one for all the evils done to the natural world, and one for all the evils that adults do to each other. Uh, a raised eyebrow for all those times in life when we need to have surprise and discovery and excitement, the things that make our eyebrows go up. If you haven't had your eyebrows go up in a long time, you're probably living in too small of a box for your soul to breathe need to go out and do something new and fresh, something that makes you laugh, something that makes you go, oh, wow, never saw something like that before. Something that makes you marvel, something that makes you whisper, wow, wow, and not be able to find another word for what you're seeing, because it is so awesome. There's also this green vine, which could be the olive branch of peace, uh, but it could also be a vine symbolizing growth. I always make sure the bottom stem of it is pointed toward my mouth, however, because my prayer when I'm applying the makeup and, and when I do my ritual transformation, I treat the application of makeup as itself being a prayer. And so when I paint this on, I'm specifically thinking, as long as I am in this ritual garb, may my words be words that give life and peace and growth to people. Uh, something that will make them feel alive and feel themselves expanding and putting out new leaves and growing in new directions, uh, winding and twisting and turning however they need to, 
to deal with the unpredictabilities of life and allowing uh, the wisdom of God woven throughout creation in mysterious and frequently challenging ways to be my teacher so that when I see what is happening in nature I may learn something from it because ultimately life is about the growth of the soul. Uh, I put opalescent glitter all over my face. I don't know how well it shows up in the studio lights here or not, but um, to the reminder is that we are spirits in bodies and that there's a reason the two are together. There is something the spirit needs within this physical life, but this physical life ultimately is to serve the growth of the spirit, the growth of the soul. It is not an end in itself just to be lived as hedonistically and, and oriented around nothing other than pleasure. The Narcissism is extreme selfishness. Hedonism is just going for the pleasure and experience. The problem that both of them contain is that neither of them contains relationship. The, all of the, the pleasures of the body, all of the things in life can be experienced and can be pleasurable. But if you experience them in relationship, the rest of the picture comes together in marvelous ways and you become more of a multi-dimensional person than you could ever be otherwise. And I'm noticing that we have come to the end of our show and I still haven't gotten through so many of the symbolisms. It's my wonderful gold shoes. They're gold shoes because I want the steps of my life to be good as gold and generously laced with love.